I think you guys enjoy praising Jesus. Amen. If I'm right, can I just get one big amen from the church who loves praising Jesus? You sound like you enjoy that. Um, I heard a story recently. I'm going to pass it on to you. Man and his wife lay down one evening to go to sleep. It was uh, thunderstorm kind of weather, quite like what we've been experiencing around here in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. They lay down. Rain is pounding the house. They can hear the distant thunder, but they go off to sleep. At about 3 o'clock, somebody bangs on the front door pretty loudly. They startle awake, and the guy jumps up, and he says, I'm going to go check and see what's going on downstairs. So he goes downstairs, and he looks through the little glass panel in the door, and he sees a silhouette of a large man knocking on the door. And he just opens the door ever so slightly, and he says, can I help you? And the, and the man says, well, it's storming out here. So I know it's 3 o'clock in the morning. I need a push. And the, the man of the house says, look, it's storming, it's three o'clock in the morning, good luck, bud, I'm not coming out to give you a push right now, you know, so sorry. He shuts the door and he goes, he locks it, he goes back up to his wife and he lays down and he says, kind of reports the story. It was a man, it's raining, three o'clock in the morning, he's asking for a push. And she said, well, what, did you give him a push? And he said, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. And she said, honey, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. She said, if it was you, in the rain, 3 o'clock in the morning, what would you hope your neighbor would do? He says, all right, all right. He goes back down, opens the door. The man's not on the porch, so he calls out into the night. He says, are you still there? The man says, yeah, I'm still here. He says, do you still need a push? Yeah, I need a push. He says, well, where are you? I can't see you. And the man says, where, where do you think I am? I need a push. And he says, well, I don't know where you are. And he says, I'm on your swing. It's kind of funny. It's creepy more than it is funny, if we're honest. Like, when I heard it, I didn't even laugh. I'm like, that is so creepy. That's why I have Kristen answer the door after midnight. You know, I'm just like, <laughs> I, so don't, don't think about the end of it. Think about the part where he lays back down and he says, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. It's raining. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to do that. Hey, we're in John chapter 13. Get your Bibles. The story of Jesus who grabs the towel. So we're going to call the sermon, Pick Up the Towel. Let me tell you what's going on as we open up to John 13. Jesus is in his final 24 hours before the cross. It's a holiday. Passover and the holiday preparations are being made in an upper room by Jesus' disciples. So this is supposed to be the time we all look forward to every year where you kick back, you recline, you enjoy a nice meal with your friends and family. Raise your hand if that's the place you love to be in life, around the table with friends and family. That's where he's headed. When he gets there, he looks around the room and sadly Jesus finds dirty feet and proud hearts. Let me be more clear. He finds dirty feet because he finds proud hearts. And so the men are all around the table, and the customary washing of the feet has not happened. Why? Because you know the disciples were thinking, I'm not doing that. So turn to your neighbor, be interactive this morning, turn to your neighbor and just say to him, I'm not doing that. Okay. Here's what happened. Some of you turned to your neighbor and said, I'm not doing that. And all the rest of you just sat there and thought, I'm not doing that. <laughs> and we know the disciples were arguing. So it's deeper than just, I'm not doing that. They're also saying, I'm not doing it for them. And that runs, that runs really deep. But enter Jesus and this historic moment of extravagant servanthood and humility. John 13, verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? 
This just very quick exchange shows us just the magnitude of this moment when Peter spoke up, breaks the silence and says, whoa, don't do that. Are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Peter's on a roll right now. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you. Here he's speaking about who would betray him. And that's why he said, not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asks them and he's asking you and me this morning. Do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord and rightly so for that is what I am. But now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. But now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. It is absolutely impossible for me to put into words what has just happened. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the mighty God, the Prince of peace, the wonderful counselor, the everlasting father, the great I am, the bread of life, the light of the world, the logos behind all creation has got down on his knees, grabbed a towel and 12 men's stinky, dirty feet, and he's washed them with his hands. I cannot describe that to you. The best I could imagine would be the Queen of England knocks on your door and says, would you let me in? I'm here to scrub your toilet. To which you would say, no, not that, not you. And even that is so infinitely anemic to what is actually happening with Jesus washing these disciples' feet. When you see a towel, I pray that this lesson hits you again from John 13. Do you know what the towel of Christ means? The towel of Christ teaches disciples of Christ to do that even for them. I'm not doing that, you say. And the next time you say, I'm not doing that, and especially not for them. Remember this story, will you? And remember the example Jesus says, that he is set for us. So at the end of the chapter, John 13 and 35, he's going to say, a new command I give you, love one another. Well, that's not new. As I have loved you, so you ought to love one another. And by this, all men will know that you are my disciples. Emphasis on as I have loved you, which pairs then the beginning story and the end of the chapter so that what we get is this massive example that all of us are called to follow. And what I want to do then is break down the example of Jesus in four steps. What exactly did he do? How are we supposed to follow it in these four steps? Starting with where you might not expect us to start. The example of Jesus does not start when he gets up from the table. His example starts with what he's doing when he sits at the table first. Number one, if you're taking notes, they're underlined on the screen. Here we go. Jesus was humble because he was secure. That's the first example that he sets for us. Before he even gets up from the table, Jesus was humble because he was secure. Let me explain. We know from Luke's account what the disciples are talking about around the table, and it is ugly. They're having an argument about who's the goat, the greatest of all time for the rest of you. They're having an argument about who's the greatest, who gets the positions of power in the kingdom. Jesus is witnessing this argument. He hears it, and here's what they're doing. They know that Jesus is king, they know he's, he's ushering in the kingdom of God. They know that there are positions of authority in his kingdom. They just don't know what positions each of them will be granted. And so they have an unanswered question in their head. And the unanswered question becomes deep insecurities in their heart. Now follow me. 
the deep insecurity in their heart means everybody around the table is now a threat. Everybody is in competition with one another. And those deep insecurities keep them paralyzed in serving one another because they see one another as threats in the, the great game of life. And you don't serve the one that is threatening to you. But in contrast, verse 3, before he gets up from the table, the Holy Spirit reveals to the Apostle John that Jesus knew with great confidence, with great security, that the Father had put all things under his power. Jesus knew he was from God, and Jesus knew he was returning to God. So he got up. Jesus knew he had security and confidence as he was meditating on his position in God and on the love of God. So he gets up from the table. One thing leads to the, to the other. Verse 3 precedes verse 4, not just mathematically, but in principle. So he gets up from the table. This is what is true. It's always the secure who are humble. G.K. Chesterton, it's always the secure who are humble. And so then you wonder, how can we get to the very position that Jesus was in in verse 3 that prompted him to verse 4? I was reading some John C. Maxwell on feelings of success and security in this life. I just want to read to you something from uh, Maxwell. The continual search for the feeling of success and security is one of the main reasons people are so miserable. If you chase this feeling by accumulating wealth or stacking accomplishments, you will doom yourself to a continual roller coaster changing from successful to unsuccessful, secure to insecure with every mood change. Life is uncertain, emotions aren't stable, the feeling of success and security that comes from the world can be taken by the world at a moment's notice. So the only way, if it's not accumulating wealth, if it's not stacking accomplishments, if it's not reaching a certain status, the only way then to truly feel secure is to practice what Jesus was practicing in verse 3. God loves me. I'm going home to the Father Amen. who has prepared a place for me. I have a place in God's kingdom. Amen. Earlier, I asked you to repeat something after me, and some of you did. Would you guys be willing to practice this, verse 3, just to see if verse 4 doesn't follow? Let's practice it, okay? I'm going to say a line, then you'll say it. Or, of course, you'll sit there and say, I'm not doing that, but <clears throat> I want to say it, then you say it. And we're going to practice verse 3 for a minute, okay? God loves me. I am going home to the Father. I have a place in God's kingdom. That's practicing what Jesus was doing at the table. Meditating on the love of God in his secure place in God's love. What happens when we do that? And I, let, me, let me be honest, and I'm going to get to this. For a while, I thought about this as soft Christianity. Like, get to the, the meat, the real stuff. This cannot be, this is just emotional fluff that preachers do because, you know, it, it, it makes people feel good and stuff. I don't agree with that anymore. Jesus was meditating on these things in verse 3, church. This is not soft Christianity. This is very, very important stuff. He was secure in his place in God's kingdom and in God's love. I thought about this as soft, but I just want you to think about it. When we get this down, everybody in your life will stop being a threat to you. It will all stop being a big competition. I'm just secure in God. And then you'll be the one free to serve people out of that place of security. God loves me. I'm going home to the Father. I have a place in God's kingdom. I'm stable. I'm secure in his hand. The others were arguing about their insecurities. That's what made them unfit to grab the towel. And it's what made Jesus fit to grab the towel. If we go down one step deeper in all of this, I want you to notice this. The greatest motivation to serve, therefore, is not the need in front of us, but the love of God within us. Everybody sees the need, but not everybody's motivated to serve. Jesus saw the need. But it was the love of God in him that leads to the so in verse 4. So he got up from the table and he picked up the towel. Here's the next thing he did. He trades the table for the towel. The table 
oh, the holiday table. It's just time to relax and to eat. It's like that rest you work all year for. It's that reward, the divine reward of just sit back, football games on, your favorite meals in front of you, your favorite people all around you. And Jesus trades that in. He's got less than 24 hours. This is his last meal. If anybody should have just been entitled to sit down and to relax, it's Jesus. But he trades a posture of relaxation for a posture of action as a servant. He takes up the towel. He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped the towel around his waist. I'm not going to wrap this one around my waist for the end of the sermon, you know, and all that. But I'll tell you that the towel was only supposed to be picked up by the lowliest of lows. This is a servant's job. Often, if possible, we find a, a Gentile slave to do it because this is pretty low. And Jesus trades the table for the towel. I just want you to notice why he does it. It's the holiday, and he's only 24 hours from glory. But John tells us he loved them to the end. He saw in this meal more divine purpose than just his own comfort. He saw purpose in this beyond relaxation, even though he's 24 hours away. So Paul would say it like this, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Jesus is calling us. Like we're not going to just kind of finish weak. We're not going to peter out. We're not going to grow tired of doing good. We're not going to end with a fizzle. Everybody's got to have the finish strong mentality that comes from Jesus right here. So let me do something I very rarely do. I'm going to address a, a, a population in this church that I don't speak to directly very often. I would like to talk for a minute to the older members of this church. I didn't say old. I said older, by the way, in case you didn't hear me, members of the church. I don't speak to you very often, just, you know, just us. Everybody else take a break for a minute. To the older members of the church, listen to what we just read. Jesus is in his final hours. And he finds purpose for his life beyond simply being comfortable. He finds purpose. Here's the message. You're still here. God still has a plan for your life. If you're still here, God still has feet for you to wash. If you're still here, God still has something for you to do. And I know you might think, especially my generation has already written you off and moved on. That's not true. You still set the pace. You still lead. And the older generation, when you get your hands dirty, you're leaving that legacy of finishing strong to the very end. He loved them to the very end. I like this quote. I'm not, I'm not at this age, but just listen. when you cease to make a contribution, you begin to die. Well, let's finish strong then. But to do that, we're going to have to dismantle the deception behind retirement in this day and age. By the way, congratulations for all of you who are retired. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I hope you enjoy your retirement, but we have to be very careful to dismantle the kind of retirement that woos us to throw in the towel and call it quits. Because if you're still here, there's still purpose, there's still a plan, and there are still feet to wash. Yes. So somebody needs to nudge this man and say, Jesus finished strong. Now, again, I hope you have lots of moments like this. My goodness, you've earned rest. But there's still a plan if you're here. There's still purpose. And there are still feet to wash. And you still set the tone. You still set the pace. And while I'm talking to the older members, let me switch gears. I'm going to talk to the youngest members of this church. We've got to leave the version of childhood that shields us from all responsibility. There is a version of childhood that is a deceptive version. It is not God-honoring, which is now here, here. You don't need to carry any weight or practice responsibility in your childhood. Ten-year-olds, it's time to pick up the towel. It's time to walk into a room and say, hey, I'm here to serve. How can I help? 15-year-olds, it's past time. Let's go. 25-year-olds, it's time to leave the version of childhood that says I'm shielded from all responsibility. I'm going to put that on others. All right? Now, Jesus lived in a pattern. He lived in a pattern of reclining at the table, which is rest, Sabbath, reward, divine communion, and serving with the towel. 
Only you by the Holy Spirit needs to know what's my next move. If, if you're just stuck at a table, you're in me mode, relaxation mode, entitlement mode, comfort mode, then Jesus says, follow my example and pick up the towel. If you're in towel mode, you haven't taken a, a Sabbath, you're not resting, the Holy Spirit will prompt you and say, I certainly need rest as Jesus rested. And by the way, he did return to the table. It's a pattern, but certainly we have to pick up the towel. Number three, as we're following his example, Jesus cleaned up the mess he did not make. So what we read in, in verse five is he poured water into a basin, and began to wash his disciples' feet, dried them with the towel that was around him. Just quick pause. Jesus has walked into the room, he sees dirty feet, he sees proud hearts. Jesus did not make this mess. We're sitting around reclining and eating with dirty, stinky, nasty feet. Jesus was the last person responsible for washing the feet. Somebody let the ball drop. Somebody didn't do their job. I'm going to switch analogies for a minute. Let's talk football for a second. Do you know where the phrase, take the hit, comes from? It's a football phrase. I want you to imagine we're towards the end of the game. Quarterback has the ball. He's waiting for a route to develop so that his receiver will be in the end zone for the game-winning touchdown pass. The receiver needs about two seconds for this route to develop. But what has happened is a defensive lineman has broken through the offensive line. And guess what? He's going to be at the quarterback in just about two seconds. What's the quarterback to do? He can tuck the ball, avoid injury, avoid getting wrecked, and go down and protect himself. Because uh, after all, why is the defensive lineman in the backfield anyway? Somebody sinned. <laughs> Looks like 55 did in this picture. <laughs> Somebody messed up. He missed his block. Or the offensive lineman coach doesn't know how to do his job. Or the head coach is just so bad at recruiting. You know, we've got scrubs out here who can't protect the coach. Somebody has sinned, and it's layered, and it's very complicated. And now somebody has to pay the price. Somebody's got to take the hit. And the quarterback can do that and still get this ball off and win the game and deliver the team from the mess that he did not create. Maybe that's what he chooses to do. Or maybe he doesn't. And he brings 55 over and puts him in front of the media. I don't know. Somebody's got to pay the price. Jesus is always doing more than what he's doing in the moment, isn't he? It's always symbolic. Jesus has a towel. He didn't make this mess. And he's got feet in his hands with the towel. And he's taking the dirt of his disciples' feet and he's bringing it to himself putting it on the very towel that he's wearing, foreshadowing what he's going to do tomorrow. When he takes a mess he did not create, a problem he did not make, and he's going to take the sins of the world, of which he has not contributed one, onto himself and experience the full blow physically, emotionally, and spiritually of the stuff we did wrong. And Jesus is going to take that onto himself. What is a servant then? A servant is one who says, I don't know whose fault this is, but I will bear the cost. I will take the hit. And Jesus says, follow me. I have set for you an example. Oh, no, not that. I don't want to do that. But Jesus did that. It plays itself out in so many different ways. At work, somebody's got to take the hit for the mistake. You want to throw them all under the bus, and certainly there is such a thing as accountability, but over and over, somebody's got to step up. At home, somebody's got to take the hit. Somebody's got to fill it in. Why did it happen? It's very complicated. Just imagine as we go off the trivial football analogy, somebody comes to you with a real problem of poverty and homelessness. And you say, okay, but why is there homelessness in our streets? Something went wrong. Something went awry. Who was it? Their parents do something wrong? Neglect, abuse? 
Was it their employer who did something? Was it them? They not pay attention in school or something? Why is this a thing? And it's complicated and it's layered, quite like taking a hit in football. What went wrong? Something went wrong. But all we know now is somebody has to take a hit. And a servant says, I don't know whose fault this is, but I will take the hit. And I will pay a price of which I did not accumulate. Now, you might say, see, I don't want to do that. And there are a lot of things in life where that's what comes to our mind. Not that, but here's where it gets even more complicated. Sometimes it's not that. It's I don't want to do it for them. And the them is what really sinks deep to the heart level. And when you get to that place, I would do that, but not for them. Remember this. Jesus served Judas. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in his spirit. And he testified, very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. And this is what he says about that. It's the one I'm going to give this piece of bread to after I've dipped it in the dish. And then he dipped the piece of bread and he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. And as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What do we learn, church, by the fact that Judas had his feet washed by Jesus? You'll never see a greater contrast in the history of the world. The light of the world, down low, holding the feet of a man who had sold his soul to the devil. The darkness of the world had so filled him that he would betray his Lord and his friend. What do we learn from that? The lesson we learn from it, I honestly wish it wasn't true. Such a hard lesson. Here it is. Our main obstacle to loving the people in our lives is not the people in our lives, it's the pride in our hearts. I wish that this weren't true and some of you are thinking it can't be. It's them, right? Surely it's them. But if Jesus washed Judas's feet, then our main problem, loving the people in our lives, is not the people in our lives, but the pride in our hearts. And not to be outdone, Peter got his feet scrubbed that night too. And within 24 hours would deny Jesus three times. Is Jesus telling us to do the thing we don't want to do to the people we don't want to do it to? Absolutely. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That would be an easy way out. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your father in heaven. Jesus never asks you to do what he himself is not willing to do. So here are the kinds of people that he wants to come to your mind as you think about this. This is the them. I don't want to do that. I certainly don't want to do it for them. And here's the them. People who are not like us and people who do not like us. And you say, not them. And Jesus looks at you gently and he says, follow my example and wash Judas's feet. All right, so let me ask you some questions. It's just us. You don't have to answer out loud. Which of you conservatives are going to wash the feet of a liberal in 2024? Not them, right? Which of the liberals in the room are going to wash the feet of a conservative in 2024. Not them, you say. By the way, I'm throwing these grenades. Uh, I'm going to go back to the West Campus next week anyway. <laughs> so I don't have to clean it up. Um, and here's where you say, well, I don't want to affirm them. Do you think, church, that Jesus was affirming Selling our soul to the devil when he washed Judas's feet? Certainly not. Certainly not. But did he love him? And did he serve him? Do you think Jesus is affirming, denying him three times with cursing? Absolutely not. But did he serve Peter? Absolutely. So which of you will make a little extra dinner and go feed a neighbor who's not like you, and who doesn't like you. 
Which of you will roll the garbage can down to the street or help mow a lawn or watch some kids or bake some cookies, take care of the sick who are not like you and who don't like you? You don't want me to wait to November to bring all this up, do you? Probably should get ahead of it, shouldn't we? It's time to get ahead of it. That those who don't like you, those who are not like you, we still love freely. Christians have always loved freely. Christians have always given their best to all people. We don't hold back just because they're not like us or because they don't like us. And you say, I don't want to affirm sin, and neither did Jesus. But when the Pharisees came to him and they said, you eat with tax collectors and prostitutes? Are you affirming this sin? Jesus was not but he loved all people. That, even for them, absolutely. Mother Teresa, who was known for selfless, sacrificial service to all people, loved them all, the poor as well, very, very deeply. She had a poem written on the side of her wall, and it was inspiration for her, but it was also for the children who would come and see this, this wall in Calcutta. I'm going to read this to you. Just take this from her. People are often unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered. Can I get an amen, somebody? Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some unfaithful friends and some genuine enemies. Succeed anyway. If you are honest and sincere, people may deceive you. Be honest and sincere anyway. What you spend years creating, others could destroy overnight. Create anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, some may be jealous. But be happy anyway. The good you do today will often be forgotten. Do good anyway. Give the best you have. And it will never be enough. Give your best anyway. For in the final analysis, it's between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. So Jesus then says after performing an indescribable act of love and humility, doing that even for them, he says, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you take good sermon notes. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you talk about it at summer camp or VBS. No, he says, and you finish this. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. That, for them, he says, go and do them. Because when you pick up the towel, you also pick up a blessing. Not circumstantial. It's not a way to get rich. It's not a way to improve your life now. When you pick up the towel, you enter into a deeper, more intimate relationship with God than anybody else will be able to understand. And when you pick up the towel, you are immediately picking up transcendent joy and the direct favor of God who says, how about you trust me with the table? I'll trust you with the towel. Go serve your fellow mankind. So here's what I would like to do. I would like it if you guys would stand and I'm going to pray a prayer of the heart of a servant that the Holy Spirit would so fill us with the security and the love of God that out of the overflow, you would trade the table for the towel, you would humble yourself and do that even for them. Let's pray. Lord, this is a hard teaching and a hard example. And at our best, even, we don't want to follow it. And so I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would teach us about the love of God so we would know how wide how long, how deep, how high is this love of God? And that in it and through it, every body, even them, they'd be blessed because of us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.